Hey, Enjoy Church, it is so good to be with you. You know, I've had this on my heart to share this with you for a long time. One of the things that my dad taught me when I was a little boy, actually it wasn't comfortable at the time, was to never quit. He used to say this phrase that quitters never win and winners never quit. And it sounded good and I was excited about it until I wanted to quit. I want to talk to you guys just for a little while today about developing staying power. Here's what I know, that successful people, if you look at the traits of successful people, doesn't matter if they're local, people in your lives or on a national stage or even a world stage. One of the things that I know about you being successful, fruitful, multiplying in your life, what God says to do, and uh, to, to have a meaningful life, is that you're going to have to overcome and persevere. And I want to talk to you about how to develop that staying power for just a few minutes today. I'm so thankful that you're here and God is doing such great things. I, I love our church. I love you enjoy church. And uh, I know sometimes we go through difficult things and it seems like when are we going to break through in this area or when is this going to happen? But here's what I know. It is breaking through. We've had many, many breakthroughs over the years and God is a miracle working God. But here's the other thing about God. God works in conjunction, in communion with you and me. He invites us into this wonderful thing called life. And when he gave us the assignment to be fruitful and multiply, we literally have a job assignment, a life purpose, and a life meaning. And uh, the enemy wants the opposite. He wants you to back off. He wants you to quit. Did you know that the only way you really fail is to stop to quit? that if you'll get back up, it doesn't mean that you won't have uh, setbacks and that you won't fall down, but that you'll get back up and you'll get at it again. And let me encourage you today, and, and let me encourage you that we can do this together. There's something about people not quitting together and having and developing perseverance and staying power when we do it together. It's easier to quit when you're isolated. It's easier to quit when you're all by yourself and we're not going to do that. That's why we have our small group ministry, which if you're not in one, I encourage you to get in a small group. And if you're, uh, if you're here at Enjoy Church, hey, pray about, you don't have to pray very long, pray about leading one for a semester. You don't have to do it for the rest of your life. You may love it though and end up doing it the rest of your life. But hop in there. So today, let's talk about for a few minutes about how to just develop that staying power. I love it. I love it. I have some friends that just don't know when to quit. And I declare that over your life. You're one of those people. You just don't know when to quit. May that be said over your life. Man, they just don't know when to quit. That's a good thing because you will win your battles in life. You'll overcome them if you just don't know when to quit at all. So we're going to get a fresh start every day. That's the great thing about a new morning is we get a fresh start every day. You can, you can develop your perseverance by hanging in there another day. You can do that. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he says this, don't lose heart. Don't lose heart. One of the ways that you and I develop persistence is to not lose heart. You know, in the beginning of something, you start off and it's easy because you've got the heart for it. The heart represents your passion. It represents your energy for it. But many times when the difficulties show up, and it doesn't take very long for the difficulties, the opposition to show up, it can wear you out. It can suck the joy or the energy out of your life, and you want to quit. I want to share with you today, don't lose heart. Paul says, I don't give up. I like what he says. He says in verse 8, we're hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. Paul's saying, look, we're hitting it from every side. We're getting it from the front, from the back. This is happening, that's happening. But guess what? We're not quitting. I love that, don't you? Uh, let me just pray for you right now, even at the beginning of what I wanna share with you for just a few minutes today. I wanna just pray for you because some of you that are here with us today, you're facing opportunities to quit maybe a quit on a marriage or to quit on a job or a career where i think uh 
it, quitting on a dream is a bad thing to do. You know, sometimes you've got a dream in your heart that seems so far away, seems so impossible from the circumstances that you're in today. And the temptation is to just settle, to pull back and to say, you know what, let's just coast. Let's just get from one week to the next and Believe me, that's not God's best for your life. Let me pray for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, as we're together today and we're gonna hear your word, what your word has to say about this topic of developing and nurturing our staying power, Lord, I pray for every dream represented here, every marriage represented here, every relationship represented here. And Father, all of the ideas and dreams and possibilities in us, may we never back off, may we never quit from what you have hardwired us to do, what you have designed us to do, and that is to live a meaningful, purpose-filled life. We just thank you for that in Jesus' name, amen. You've got the victory. So hang in there, all right? Just hang in there. As we study Paul, Paul's life represents a life of great resilience. I mean, this guy went through a ton of stuff, which he'll share, and some of you maybe right now are going through a ton of stuff, and maybe your life resume is just like Paul's. You've been through a lot of stuff, but I'm going to give you a few things today that you'll be able to remember. The first one is this. Remember, we've been talking about it right here at Enjoy Church for the past several weeks. Remember this. God loves you, and God is good, and God is good all the time. He's good. If you'll remember that as the foundation, start at that place. Okay, I feel like quitting. I feel like throwing in the towel. I feel like backing off. I feel like going into coast mode. It's, we're, we're right at the beginning of summertime. And, and, oh, wouldn't it be nice to just take the three or four months off and just coast and get through. And then we'll hit it hard again in September. No, 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 no. No, enjoy your summer. Enjoy your time but you can overcome and triumph over the enemy's attacks in your life by remembering the foundation. The foundation of all these things is that God is good. He's good all the time and he loves you. I love, Peter was always talking about how much he loved God and, and, and John, the apostle John was always talking about how much God loved him. And I just wanna encourage you, the right one is John. Because if you can focus on how much God loves you, you'll overcome yourself. Because my worst enemy is the enemy, it's me. And it's myself, it's my mind, it's the tiredness that I go through. How about you? You guys experience that as well? So let's remember that. He says here in verse one, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. So don't lose your passion, don't lose your energy, don't lose your heart. In 1 Corinthians 15, 15, Paul says, it's by the grace of God that I am who I am. Or one translation says, I am what I am. And what he's talking about there is grace represents the power of God. The grace of God is the power of God making us who we are. So what I want you to know today is that when you experience the grace of God through the love of God, like we're talking about, you'll automatically as a byproduct experience the energy of God, the strength of God, and the power of God to help you get through another day, to get through another month of opposition and make it through. Here's what I can promise you, that if you keep putting one foot in front of the other in this faith walk, it takes faith to do it, that you will come through it. You will come through the discouragement. You will come through the problems. And you just, uh, you're just going to. Now, you don't have to Prove to everybody else how valuable you are. When you know that God loves you, your value is, is established. And many times we, and we don't know that and we haven't focused on that, we go through life trying to prove to ourselves and trying to prove to others that God loves us. And then don't forget, before I share the second thing with you here, that it is the grace of God that provides the power for you to keep on going. And that comes through worshiping Him, focusing on how much He loves you, and knowing that through his grace, it provides you with the strength. It's enough to get you through another hour, another day in Jesus' name. The second thing that I wanna share with you, this is so powerful. Boy, I've experienced this in my life so much and that is the value for not quitting comes so much from a clear, clean conscious. You've heard me teach on this. You guys have heard me teach on this quite a bit. 
And that is that you either have a righteousness consciousness, which is a clear conscious because the blood of Jesus has washed all of your sins away. It doesn't mean you're perfect. And it doesn't mean that you've got it all together. It doesn't mean that you're perfect. But what it does mean is that you are through your relationship with Christ, allowing the work of the power of the blood to cleanse your shame and to pull away your guilt and to give you a fresh, crisp, clean conscience for living today. Boy, there's energy in that. And you'll be able to walk further, walk faster, and get through so much more with a clean conscience. Listen to what he says in verse 2. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We don't use deception, nor we distort the word of God. We don't twist it to make it ours. We commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. In other words, he says, we don't let other people tell us how bad we are or how good we are. No, no, no. We go before what the word says about us, what the blood has done for us the life of the Holy Spirit making the word alive in us, revealing to us that, hey, your sins are forgiven past, present, future. Your sins are forgiven, church. And because of that, when you're aware of that in your aware conscious and in your subconscious, man, your focus can go on what it needs to be. But when we've chosen to walk in a lifestyle of sin that we refuse to be honest about, that's what he said, we renounce secret, shameful ways. In other words, it's all on the table, baby. There's nothing hidden here. We are telling you all uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And Paul does that about himself. He says, man, I have, I'm the worst of sinners. He's really honest with us. In fact, in Romans chapter 7, where he says, the thing I want to do, I don't do. The thing that I don't want to do, I end up doing. He says, what a wretched man that I am. How wretched am I? Well, what is Paul doing? He's being honest. He's just saying, look, I don't have anything to hide. I don't have any shame. I've been messed up. I'm just like you. We're, we're human beings that were purchased by the blood of Jesus and bought by the grace of God, saved through faith as we confess him as our Lord and Savior. That relationship develops. And uh, I, I just want you to know today, when you've thought about his love and you focused on his love, and then you realize that because of the work of Christ that your conscience is clean. You're going to get your staying power back. Let me share with you a third one. And that is to have the right kind of motivation. When I say the right kind of motivation, we're motivated by a lot of different things. Did you know that you can be motivated inwardly by that passion and by that uh, design that God put on the inside of you? That drive that comes from the inside of being right with God, having a clean conscience and knowing that you love him and you're so grateful and you're so thankful for what he's done for you, it develops a right kind of a motivation. You need to be motivated. In fact, David said, I encourage myself in the Lord. So when life gets tough, there's something about pulling aside for a minute. I This is what I do. I close my eyes and I become sensitive and aware of the presence of God. And David said it this way. He said that be still, be still, and know that I am God. And when I intentionally focus on the fact and on the truth that, that God is God and that God is right here in my presence, he's with me right now, he's with me today, guess what happens when that happens? I become energized at that point, motivated with energy. I love that. Verse five says this, we don't preach ourselves, but Jesus as Lord or, and ourselves as the servants for Jesus. Servants for Jesus. So when I pull back and I realize, you know what? I am a servant of Jesus. That's what it's about. Because he's been so good to me. I just want to serve him. Have you ever had somebody in your life? I've had, you know, mentors of mine that I love them so much and I just want to please them. I, what I guess what I'm looking for from my mentors in my life is thumbs up, man. You're doing good. What a great job, Darren. You, you nailed that. Darren, what you've done. See, that's what we all want from our mentors. But I don't know that we always focus on or think about the fact or the truth that Jesus is our greatest mentor. There should never be anybody in my life that I want to please more than the one who paid for my eternal salvation, who gave a covenant with me, 7,000 promises that he said are yes and amen, and to you too. 
I, I, I want to please him. I'm motivated by that. And there's, so there's an internal motivation. There's an external motivation. When I was a kid growing up, the external motivation of the church was, you better be good or you'll burn. Turn or burn. You know, uh, my friend Dave Martin says, tithe or God will take it out of your hide. And God doesn't take it out of your hide, but the world system does. It'll If you're not in the sweet spot of God's blessing, man, the enemy, it, he'll, he'll take that right out of your hide and, uh, and then blame it on God when it wasn't God at all. It was me. So I need to learn that there's internal motivation, there's external motivation. Sometimes the external motivation can be good, but it can also be bad. It can be a threat, you know, like you do this or else fill in the blank, you're in trouble. Do this or you go to the principal's office, do this or I will leave you. Do this or you're fired. No, no, those aren't, those aren't quality, really healthy motivations. The healthy motivation comes from a goal and from a purpose and fulfilling that goal. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, you might remember this, he kind of gives this resume of how much opposition attacked his life, Paul says. Five times, he says, I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. I don't know why he doesn't just say 39, but that's the way they said it back in the day was 40 lashes minus one, which mathematically is 39 lashes, right? He says, I've had that happen three times. I've been beaten with wood rods. Can you imagine that? He says, once I was stoned, and that wasn't medically stoned either. He was stoned by stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea just floating because of a shipwreck. He said, I've been in constant danger. I've been without food many times. I've gone without sleep. Maybe some of you can identify with that sleep and that food thing, maybe. And then he says, I've been thirsty. I've been hungry. I have been cold. Besides this, he says, probably the greatest pressure is the daily pressure and the concern for all the churches. I relate to that one for sure. Anyway, Paul's saying, look, there's a bunch of stuff here. But he goes on and says, I did it all for the sake of Christ. I did all of it for the sake of Jesus Christ. And, you know, I remember it, seasons of my life when we've been building the church and going through seasons where, you know, I didn't see the growth as fast as I wanted it to see. And I, there were lots of pressures and lots of heartaches in the, in, in the midst. And, and there were other opportunities. I got phone calls to come and pastor large churches that were paid off and had 80 acres and but I knew God had called me here but staying here meant opposition and some hardship but guess what that's where I'm supposed to be and so I want to say to you sometimes the grass looks greener on the other side but the water bill is much much higher hang in there and, and don't quit I like what Paul said in Colossians uh, Colossians chapter 3 verse 23 he says this it's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Whatever you do, do it with all of your heart. Whatever you do, whatever it is. And you know, I've tried to do that almost most of my life, whatever job. Do you know that almost every job I've had, I, I liked. I've had probably about six jobs, starting from a, a little boy when I was a, I had paper routes to, uh, I worked on the barges for a little while. I um, worked in the grocery business and I did construction, I did electrical work. I've done, I sold real estate even for a little while. That's right. And you know what, I enjoyed everything I've done. Why? Because I tell you, I think is because it wasn't that I had a passion necessarily for the thing that I was doing, but I had a passion for doing whatever I do with all of my heart and just deciding that I'm gonna have fun doing what I'm doing. And here's the key to it, the end of the verse. He says, whatever you do, do it wholeheartedly. One translation says, do it with all your heart, but do it to, uh, as unto the Lord, not as unto men. Remember this one. This is huge because in, especially here in the church, sometimes we, sometimes we serve in a department here in the church. We'll serve in the bookstore, the, the children's ministry, as an usher, as a greeter, the parking lot ministry, the worship team, whatever it is, media. And... Uh, We'll, we'll do it and it seems like nobody notices and it seems like there's no reward in it. 
But I want you to remember, you're not doing it for the reward from men. However, I want to give you a reward because you all are so faithful. I want to just applaud you and say thank you for doing that as faithfully as you have. But the truth is, is to stay motivated from the inside out, you and I have to realize that everything we do, we're not doing for the recognition of men, but we're doing it for our Lord and our Savior. We're doing it for the one that we love. So let us remember that. Number four, this will help you develop your staying power, your persistence, your go-getter attitude, and that is to remember and realize your human limitations. You're not Superman, and neither am I. We're just not. We don't have the ability to just go endless amounts of energy all out 100% all of the time. It's impossible. You're human. You've got to pull back. You've got to go to bed at night or whatever your schedule allows. You've got to go to bed and you've got to sleep. I like what Paul says here in verse 7. He says, but we have this treasure of God. We have this, what is the treasure? Well, the treasure is the anointing of God. It is the meaning and the purpose for which God designed you. That's a treasure to the world. By the way, you hear me say this all the time. You are a gift to all of us. Yeah, you are. You're a gift. You're a gift to all of us. And I think about that. And that's a treasure on the inside of you, your time and your talents and the energy that you have and the passion and the, the meaning that you have for your life. Paul says, we have this treasure in jars of clay. One translation says cracked pots. <laughs> you can turn to somebody right now and say, hey, you're sitting with the cracked pot. We all are. We, we're broken vessels. But what's so cool about it is that God takes this special, awesome anointing, this treasure that comes from his anointing, and he places it in these physical vessels we call clay pots. We're, we're growing older, aren't we? And uh, the physical body, Paul goes on and says, we're wasting away outwardly, but inwardly we're being renewed day by day. Here's the other thing that will help you develop your staying power. This verse I read in Exodus. Remember when Joshua went into the promised land? I'm sure Joshua had what I have and probably you have too, and that is instant gratification. I want what I want and I want what I want when I want it and when I want it is now and I want it all right now. But God doesn't work that way. He's never worked that way in my life and, and I've never seen him work that way biblically speaking either because what God does is he gives us victory incrementally and with Joshua when Joshua and the children of Israel went into the promised land he said I'm not going to give it all to you you're going to have to fight these battles one by one the first battle he said I'll fight for you and that was Jericho they went into Jericho they began to march around the walls God made the walls tumble they went in they had that victory but then the rest of them, let me just read the verse to you. Exodus chapter 23, verse 29. God said to Joshua, when you come into the promised land, I'm not going to give it all to you all at once, but I'm going to drive out the giants little by little so that you can handle it. Think about that. There's some blessings. I've been preaching on how good God is and what that covenant is to you and me. There's some blessings that belong to you. They're yours. You haven't received them yet, and you might not receive them quite tomorrow, but they're on assignment for you. They're on the calendar of God's appointment book for you. You and I are going to receive them as we develop character, persistence, the ability to not quit, the ability to develop our staying power. Church, my prayer for you and Joy Church is that you and I we just have this stick to itiveness and this staying power that helps us defeat the enemy. And do you know what fear that puts in the, in, in the enemy when you won't quit? I had this little guy, this little friend in high school. He was a great friend of mine, a little guy, tough little guy. He wasn't tough enough to beat up the big guys, but um, he would fight. And man, when he would fight, he wasn't that strong. They would beat him for the first two or three minutes. But what he had that put fear in all of them is that when he was beat down and bloody, this little man would hop back up and go at it like it was his first time. Well, eventually, 
these bigger guys, stronger guys, tougher guys that did not have the staying power in these fights, uh, eventually they said, I quit. I quit. Now, here's what I know. The enemy is just like that. The enemy is a bully. He is totally a bully in your life. And I want to be like my friend was in high school. I want to be like that to the enemy that there have been times in my life where I have felt beat up and felt like I was bloodied up. But the ability like the Apostle Paul to get back up again and to go after it. Oh, come on. And, and I confess that over you today. You're that way. You're going to get back up and you're going to go at it, even if you've been beat up a little bit. And what's going to eventually happen is you're going to get a reputation in the spiritual world. Stay away from that one because they will always get back up. Let me just tell you. You are not defeated. Remember what Jesus said in John 16, 33? I told you in this world, you will have trials and tribulations and problems, but be of good cheer for I've overcome the world on your behalf and deprived it of its power to harm you. Victory is yours. And so you're going to get it. Just don't be a quitter. Number five, the fifth thing that will really help you stay motivated to stay in the game and develop your staying power is to remember this. I must, this is a requirement for me. This is probably the second most important thing besides loving God. I must develop a love for people. Well, it's just a requirement, just as a requirement. We've been reading 1 Corinthians and remember what Paul told the church of Corinth. You can have all of these skill sets and you can have all of these talents. You can raise the dead. You can heal the sick. You can speak in other tongues and you can do all of this stuff. But if you don't have love for other people, you're just a sounding, clanging cymbal out of tune. Listen, for us, the most important thing for us besides loving God is loving what God loves. And what does God love? Yeah, that's right, people. The person on your left and on your right and in front of you and behind you, your neighbors, your coworkers, uh, the politicians, the media, all those out there, everybody. God loves all of them, doesn't he? I, I'm thankful that he does because I'm one of them. And he loved me, and I'm thankful that he loved him because so are you, and he loves you as well. We've got to develop this. He says in verse 15, all of this is to your benefit so that the grace of God that is reaching more and more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Mm, I love that. And if you want to circle that word, write that one down, the benefit. Boy, there's benefits of loving people. When you have the benefit of serving Jesus because he's all about reaching people, then our priority becomes our community. It becomes evangelism. It becomes ministering to people's needs. Church, thank you for doing that. Thank you for having a heart for our community. Thank you for having a heart for being a church without walls that we take who we are inside, outside of these walls into the marketplace Entire, in, in, into the community, into the prisons, into the homes. That's who we are. That's what we do. We love what Jesus loves, and that's people. We do that. So remember that we love people, and I've got to remind myself I love people. I love people, right? Do that. And then the sixth one is this, and that is important too, and that is take time. How do I develop staying power? Take time to recharge and refuel. It's on a daily basis. Do some morning meditation or some evening meditation. And when I say meditation, read a scripture, meditate on it, allow the Holy Spirit to reveal the truth and the understanding, the rhema understanding of that word. Pray to the Lord. Take some time to be grateful and thankful for the good you have because if you don't do that, you'll notice all the bad or all the things that are wrong. Boy, that's easy to do, especially if you're worn out. I've noticed in my life when I'm worn out, I notice everything that's wrong all around me. But if I'll take time to be very intentional about what I'm grateful for and thankful for, all of a sudden my staying power, my persistence, because I can look over the problems. I say, well, yeah, there's problems, but it's not as bad as what I thought it was. And uh, God wants us to have that attitude. So pull away and get some rest, meditate. So that's on a daily basis, but also once a week, try to take some time off where you just have some time to do something different. My wife and I, we take Fridays and we try to, that's a sacred day for us. Uh, although because of the pressures and the schedules of our life, oftentimes we end up working 
half a day or several hours on a Friday, but we try to protect, for the most part, Friday as our date day. That's when we'll spend time together. We'll go to dinner. We'll go to lunch together. We'll go for a drive once in a while. We'll go sit outside. We'll do something on a Friday that we don't do any other day of the week. And I encourage you to do that. And then if you can, pull away. Pull away and do something to just rejuvenate your spirit, to re-energize your spirit, right? That's important for us because we are growing older. Outwardly, we are wasting away. Sometimes we don't have the energy outwardly that we used to have when we were 25. 25 is kind of my number. Uh, inwardly, I feel like I'm a 25-year-old. And, and uh, somebody said, well, I'm 39. Well, if you're picking, I'm picking 25, right? And, and I just want to have the energy on the outside that I've got on the inside. But our bodies get older and we don't always have that. So sometimes we have to work a little bit harder on pulling away, making sure that we are here for the long haul. And that's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm trying to do that. I've lived at a mock speed pace for many years. I've decided I want to spend many, many more years with you all. And so I'm going to pace myself for developing our teaching teams. And, and uh, we're going to be doing some things, you know, like we're doing here with video that will make sure that I wasn't, your pa I wasn't a good pastor for you for three or four or five or ten years. But I want to be your pastor and lead and raise up young people into ministry, which, by the way, I am so proud of our young people. The night of worship that they had. Uh, a, a while back, wow, we've got some new up and coming vocalists and singers and speakers. And I'm just glad to see them moving into there. And I want to pass the baton to them and be here long enough to encourage them on and to step in and to be a mentor to them. We can all do that together. So I'm not going anywhere. I'm sticking around. I want to be healthy and I want to last. Don't you? You want that too. Let's stick around and let's do this together. Yeah, we're growing old, but we're not getting old on the inside. I say amen to that in Jesus' name. My, one of my verses is Psalms 119, verse 50. It says, they that wait on the Lord, and that's what we do when we pull aside and we meditate. We're waiting on him. That, that can be taken one of two ways. We're waiting like I'm waiting for my food to come, or we're waiting like I'm serving. I'm bringing the food. I prefer to do that one because I'm serving the Lord in all that I do. But he said, when I wait upon the Lord, I'm serving him. I renew my strength and I mount up with wings as eagles and I run and I don't get weary. I walk and I don't get faint. That's a promise for me. And that's a promise for you. As I wait upon the Lord, most of us, most of the time have like, I'm waiting on you, Lord. When are you going to put that money in the mailbox? When are you going to get me that job? When are you going to get me that wife? When are you going to get me that husband? And God is saying, wait on me. In other words, put my kingdom first. It's the same thing that he's always said to us. Put the kingdom first and I will give you all of these things that you need in your life. I know you need them. I know you want them. I'm the one that gave you the desires of your heart. And then I'm going to give you the desires of your heart. As you wait upon me, you're going to renew your strength, your passion. And then number seven, the last one that I want to share with you is this. I've got to keep my eye on the goal. I've got to keep my eye on the prize. I've got to keep my eye on the purpose, the vision. Without a vision, we perish. Perish means that you die or die means that you separate. Death is separation. And when that happens, we separate from the dream, the goal, the vision that God has for us. Listen to what he says in verse 17. For this light momentary affliction or trouble, and think about that. He just gave us a list of being shipwrecked and pressed and perplexed and troubled. He says it's light. It's momentary. It's going to go away. They achieve for us. These troubles that we go through, staying in the game, not quitting, these troubles achieve for us an eternal goal that far outweighs all of the problems themselves. So here's what we do. We fix our eyes. I'm laser focus fixed. We fix our eyes, not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is unseen is eternal. And what is seen, these problems, these temporary circumstances, situations we're in, they're temporary. They're temporary. You're going to get through this. Uh, what is it you're thinking about quitting? What is it that you are 
tempted to quit. James says problems develop perseverance in us. He says when you face trials and situations, face them with pure joy. How can I do that? Well, that's weird. Look, look at these things like they're pure joy. Well, the reason is because my focus is over the top of the problems, knowing this, that those problems are going to develop for us a glory that far outweighs the difficulty of the problems that we're going through right now. So if you're in the middle of some tribulation and some trials, rise up above it. Get your eyes unfocused off this stuff. It's light. It's momentary. It's not permanent. It's not going to last forever. No, no, no. It's not going to last forever. You're going to remember. God loves me. I'm going to keep my conscience clear. I'm going to stay motivated. I'm not. I'm going to remember I do have limitations humanly. And I remember this. I love people. People are the reason we're doing this because I love Jesus. And I'm going to recharge my life. I'm going to refuel, intentionally refuel. That's what I'm praying this message does for you today is that it refuels you. And then I'm going to keep my eye on the goal. I really value, it's one of my favorite words, is the word tenacity. Do you like that word? Tenacity. I, and, and I encourage you to say this about your life. Make this a confession over your life. I am tenacious. I'm tenacious. Say that about your life. Say it with me right now. I am tenacious. I've got persistence. I've got staying power. I've got the ability to hang, baby. I am not a quitter. Quitters never win, and winners never quit. You're a winner. You are a champion in Christ. You're more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. You hang with it, and you hang with it, and keep developing your character. Galatians 6, 9 says, let us not grow weary in doing well, for at the proper time, you will reap the harvest. You're going to reap the harvest that God has for you, and it is yours. So what's your quitting point? Sometimes we'll spend $5,000, $10,000, $25,000 dollars on a wedding, but we won't spend $500 to go to a, a marriage seminar. I'm just saying perspective plays a lot, right? Don't quit on your marriage. Don't throw in the towel. I know it's difficult. He's weird. She's strange. And I know we're two people coming together, but hang in there. Put one foot in front of the other. Maybe the job is difficult and maybe God has a better job, but don't quit until you have a new one right? And maybe you've got a dream that just hasn't seemed, hang in there, hasn't seemed to come true or come about, hang in there another day. God is good. I love what Robert Schuller used to say. I love this quote. He said, tough times never last, but tough people do. Church, don't give up. Don't give up. Thanks for being with me today and church, just enjoy we're going to come out here in just a minute and uh, worship with our offering, and we're going to speak the blessing over you today. I look forward to seeing you in the next service.